I know that there are many benefits to rebounding and that's something that you very much advocate. But is there ever a time where a person perhaps should not rebound, like when they're pregnant or if they're on dialysis or any, any circumstance at all? Well, a pregnant woman rebounding is, is very good. In fact, when the baby's born and the baby's upset, the mother can get on the rebounder. Because when you think about it, if a baby's upset, we automatically jig. Mm. We automatically rock the baby. So the rebounding is, is a lovely thing to do in pregnancy and with, uh, with the new baby. And by the way, after, after the baby's born, the rebounding will help the woman's uh, uterus and pelvic floor muscles to heal. The only time a person shouldn't rebound is if it hurts. So what I say to people, when you start, just do the health bounce, which is where your feet aren't even touching. I mean, your feet are touching the rebounder. They're not, they're not lifting off the rebounder. That you just, you're just basically jigging on the rebounder. And if the body says, yeah, I like this. Yes, I like this. This is knee, ankle, hip, lower back. Mm -hmm. You see, pain is your friend. Pain will say, don't do that. And I have spoken to people who said the rebounder hurt, and I said, well, we'll bring it right back till it doesn't hurt. Mm -hmm. just, just slowly jig on it and then increase a bit more. So I always leave it up to the person. Start small, start gentle, and then slowly increase, and your body will tell you. What would you suggest if somebody's rebounding and it causes them to have difficulty breathing and heart palpitations? Um, I would look at how ferociously they were rebounding. I would also have a look, do they usually uh, have breathing problems or heart palpitations? I would look at the meal they just ate. I, I would look at a few things that can contribute to it because rebounding of itself that you know it cannot cause that that I would say there are previous factors coming to play there do you say would you say that it's good to have chia or flax on a daily basis and if so would it be best fresh or ground that's a good question the 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 flax I think it's a great idea to have on a daily basis because it's an excellent source in fact it's the highest vegetable source of your omega-3s and your omega-3 is your brain your brain um, am, omega and it also gives a lovely integrity to cell wall the body uses it for many functions but it must be ground fresh if it's not ground fresh it should be kept in the freezer mm. whereas the chia it is best soaked and it is said that it can take up to 25% its own body weight in water. <laughs> so you only have to put a tiny little bit in a jar and put mm -hmm. the and shake it. I know Cynthia, she walks around shaking mm -hmm. it. And then as that, I pour that on. In fact, I have it every breakfast and I pour that all over my fruit. What are your thoughts on apple cider vinegar? Yay or nay? <laughs> apple cider vinegar for me is nay, except it can be used to uh, get rid of a wart, mm. to dab it on every day. It also, also can be poured onto the toes if a person has tinea or athlete's foot. But it's one stage short of alcohol. It's, I do not believe it is best for the body. We had a man last week who, who uh, was commenting that every time he takes apple cider vinegar, you know, makes his gut worse. We use lemon juice instead. And Dr. Robert Young has done an excellent paper on vinegar, and he shows that it's acetaldehyde, which is actually a neurotoxin. So for someone who wants to investigate that more, they can Google vinegar and Dr. Robert Young, and they can access his paper. Another question that many people have is, what is a good plant-based source of vitamin B12? Another very good question. Um, a lot of people don't realize that B12 is an airborne bacteria. So if you've got an apple tree with apples and you're eating apples off the tree, you're getting a little bit. When you pick your parsley and put it straight into your meal, you're getting a little bit. It's an airborne bacteria. Obviously, I would wash my parsley if it had uh, any dirt on it or any manure on it. But the way my parsley grows, it's high and above all that. So I don't usually wash it. If there were animals around, I'd definitely wash it. If there are dogs mm -hmm. or cats, so a bit of discretion is needed there. But just an illustration to show you that bacteria is an airborne bacteria. 
Dr. Neil Nedley in his book um, Proof Positive, it's an excellent book, got a huge amount of information in there. He has research in there that shows that uh, B12 can be found in organically grown root vegetables. Is there any type of caffeine or amount of caffeine that is safe to consume? Uh, now when I say not really, um, some people like to make like a little slice or dessert with a little cacao and a little carob. Now if they do do that, and I agree the cacao gives it a nice bitter flavour, and the amount of caffeine a person would get, let's say they make a slice that's going to that's going to feed 16 people and there's a teaspoon of cacao and a teaspoon of carob. The amount of, of caffeine that the people get from that little tiny bit of, ca of, of uh, caffeine in the cacao is so minimal. Um, raw cacao has much less caffeine than cocoa because cocoa has been fermented mm. which releases more caffeine. So. When I say, when you say, is there any safe dose of caffeine? Um, I hesitate to answer absolute because that little bit of cacao mm. is just so minimal. But uh, regarding teas and coffees and green teas, they they are really not the best for the body because of the way the caffeine disrupts the neurotransmitters. Would there be a, some kind of substitute for caffeine? Substitute for caffeine. Let's say someone didn't want to do cacao in that 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 fresh chocolate type slice instead of using cacao they could use something like roma roma will give that bitterness but it will not get it'll not give the caffeine and for a caffeine drink um, i'm not sure exactly uh, what drinks you have here but i in australia we've got a few but i think you have roma do you have cafex there's cafex roma okay Pero, yeah did she know? caro caro is one Pero, Pero, so that you have some alternatives. And in his book, um, Caffeine Blues, the author states that the painless way to come off caffeine, say a person has three cups of coffee a day, well, the first cup of coffee, they have half a teaspoon of coffee and half a teaspoon of, say, Cafex. And they do that every cup of coffee. They'll have no symptoms of withdrawals because they're still getting a little. And then every day they have a little bit more cafex and a little less coffee. And if they do that over a week, they can usually get off all their caffeine with no bad headaches, which is what usually happens. What about decaffeinated drinks? I know often people think, okay, I, I agree with you, caffeine's bad, but I really like my green tea, I really like my herbal mm. teas that are decaf. Yeah. Are those safe? Well, I guess you'd have a look at the process of decaffeinating them, and unfortunately a lot of the processes include chemicals. So that person might not be having the caffeine, but they could be getting traces of chemicals. Speaking of getting traces of chemicals, in today's society and economy, as you know, organic foods are the best, but they're also more expensive. Can somebody that cannot afford organic all the time consume things that are not organic? Uh, I know at Misty, at Misty Mountain we have a list, and you might have one here, it's called, um, uh, it's called food, foods that are least uh, are least sprayed and mm -hmm. foods that are most sprayed. I think they call them the clean 15. Yeah, clean and 15 the, and a dirty dozen. And the dozen. dirty dozen. Okay, so the clean 15 and the dirty dozen. So I guess you just, and it's easy to get the clean 15 dirty dozen list and you just veer more to the, um, to the foods that are less sprayed. If you don't have a gallbladder, what would be some of the foods that you can eat? As you know, you, it, it's a little bit more difficult to break things down without a gallbladder. Um, well, the good news is we have an amazing body with an ability to compensate, and the liver still makes bile. The gallbladder is the reservoir for the bile. So once the gallbladder is gone, the liver is still making bile. And uh, different people find different foods. I think the, the body's guide is your best guide. But just to know that you still have bile coming through. You also have pancreatic lipase coming through, which also helps to break down the fats. 
And some people find the saturated fats easier when their gallbladder's gone because the saturated fats, the breakdown begins in the mouth. The sublingual glands release lingual lipase, which breaks down the saturated fats. But I always say to the person, you just do what works. Try different foods. In regards to sleep, I know it's a big thing and it's one of the main health laws is resting. You have made comments or mention of power hours. Is there any difference of the power hours depending on the season, summer versus winter, or is it the same all year long? A little bit of a difference. So um, in his book, um, Proof Positive, Dr. Neil Nedley, he's got a chapter called Melatonin and he defines it in there and he shows that the hours of power in the winter time are nine to two, but in, in summertime it's 10 to three. And it doesn't mean you only need to sleep in those hours because there's a whole lot of other processes that happen. And this explains why the old saying, an hour before midnight is worth two after midnight. And in his book, uh, Why We Sleep, Dr. Robert, no, Dr. Matthew Walker. Dr. Matthew Walker shows that we need those eight hours and it's not the odd day you might not get it or the odd day you do it's what what you it's the sleep that you get every night that mm -hmm. that matters and and if you couldn't do it if you couldn't get away with it the odd time I wouldn't even be able to fly although I must say that I got seven hours on the way over here which was quite phenomenal but on the third night I found it hard to sleep but I'm sleeping well now so you you do get over that but as long as most of the time you're getting those seven and a half to eight hours a night. So this would be um, eight to four a.m. It could be nine to five a.m. Uh, at a stretch in the summer, 10 to six a.m. Because in his book, uh, Why We Sleep, Dr. Matthew Walker, he shows that in those hours, there's a cleaning system happening. There's a filing system happening. There's a movement of, of the day's memories going to a long-term storage unit. And the cleaning system is cleaning up little calcified deposits that might begin. And that's why they're founding that um, people with Alzheimer's have these calcified deposits uh, building up in the in the prefrontal cortex it's called amyloid plaques and he quotes um, some famous people like uh, Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan who boasted on five hours sleep a night but they both ended up with severe dementia hmm. and he shows that if they'd been getting those early hours of the night those amyloid plaques that that a part of dementia would not have built up. So would somebody that has dementia or, or Alzheimer's, do they have any hope? Well, in, in his book, um, Stop Alzheimer's Now, uh, Dr. Bruce Fife, he, he quotes a, a few cases of turnarounds with Alzheimer's once um, the right conditions were implemented and he advocates the coconut oil. Mm -hmm. Somebody that has a yeast overgrowth, what are some of the foods that they could eat or should eat? Well, what's great for yeast overgrowth is garlic and keeping right away from refined sugars and even high sugar fruits and keeping away from the yeasts. So definitely no peanuts. No breads? Well, they could probably get away with something like the sourdough spelt or rice, food breads like that. What do you recommend for somebody that wants to, to start eating sourdough bread? Do you have a recipe? Or do you have somewhere you can, you can refer them? Um, you can get some good ideas online. I think you can even order, order the starter. But in, in the US, there's an excellent online bread company that sells beautiful gluten-free breads. They're mostly gluten-free. I think he sells four different types of bread and he developed this because his son had severe allergies and he actually uses our original starter. <laughs> I think he's in North Carolina and the website is www.simpleneeds.com. One lady looked it up and she spelt it N-E-E-D-S. 
DS and she didn't get mm -hmm. anywhere. So mm -hmm. it's a bread company, so it's K N E A D S. Mm -hmm. Like so. kneading bread. Yeah, that's right. Simple needs. Okay. What are your thoughts on baking soda and baking powder? Uh, baking powder and baking soda are very similar. Baking powder has some baking soda in it. It also has cream of tartar in it. And baking soda internally is very alkaline, so it can actually reduce stomach acid and interfere a little bit with digestion. If I bake a cake, I do put a little bit of um, baking powder in it, otherwise the bread is almost I mean the cake is almost indigestible, it is so heavy. But I, I think it's a problem if you're eating cake every day, but to put it in a cake every now and then, I don't, I don't think that it's a big deal. Regarding HIIT training, that is something that seems to target more the lower body, but what about mm -hmm. the upper body? Yep, yep. The, the, um, the upper body, uh, what we do with our HIIT training is that we run, run up and down hills and when we get to one point, it's actually we get to the front gate of our retreat, we do, uh, we do push-ups on, 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 uh, on the boards. So I think it is mindful to, uh, to do push-ups as well. So even though we do the interval training, I think my husband does 45 mm -hmm. push-ups a day. I usually do <laughs> about 16. So it is, it is true, we need to be mindful of the upper body. You mean you and Michael don't have push-up contests to see who can do more? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, when you are training or exercising, is it okay to sweat? Should somebody have more heat on so they can sweat more or should they have a fan on so they don't sweat as much? I think the perspiration is important because that's body waste coming out. Um, and some people sweat more than others. I never used to perspire, but since I began the HIIT training and also we've got a steam sauna at Misty Mountain and I steam sauna with the guests usually every week that I find that I, I'm able to perspire when I'm, when I'm exercising now. So it's an important part of exercise. Okay. Do you have any tips on hemorrhoids? Uh, on hemorrhoids, one of the best things the person can do is to invest in something called Squatty Potty, which you can get from Bed Bath and Beyond, and it sits around the toilet, so that when the person uh, sits on the toilet for their daily evacuation, their knees are in the air, and when they're in that it's like mimicking the squatting position. It takes all pressure away from the anus. And one of the problems with hemorrhoids is the pressure that's put on that area. Also, they can uh, make a suppository to wear at night so they can put it in before they go to bed and it basically soothes and, and works on the area while they sleep. And one of the best is castor oil. So there is a trick to making it. So you get a cotton ball and you moisten it with castor oil and mold it into the shape of the little finger and freeze it. Now it can take three days to freeze. And of course it cannot be inserted unless it's frozen. And so the person inserts that just before they go to sleep and the cold can shrink up, cause the hemorrhoids to shrink a little bit and the castor oil dissolves into the area and can help to, to shrink up and also soothe those hemorrhoids. But probably one of the biggest things is to check the person's drinking adequate water. They're on a plant-based fiber diet so because constipation is a big contributing factor to hemorrhoids. You mentioned the squatty potty. What if somebody can't find that? Is there an alternative? Uh, they Yes, it's probably not a good idea to squat on the toilet in case you break the top, but you can get little stools from uh, dollar stores, places like that. So that's a cheaper alternative. Okay. What can be done for IBS? For irritable bowel syndrome, we've got an irritation of the lining of the gastrointestinal tract. And there are certain foods that inflame that and one is refined sugar, also wheat inflames it, and also dairy inflames it. There is a herb called slippery elm, 
and they can take the slippery elm. Slippery elm coats, soothes and heals the lining of the gut and the slippery elm can be mixed with hot water. If someone's going 10 times a day to the toilet, they can take that every two hours, but as they start to slow down, they can, they can ease off it a little bit. And we have found that these simple dietary changes and implementing the herbs that we, we found if it's irritable bowel, uh, Crohn's disease, colitis, ulcer is, ulcerative colitis, gastritis, they all respond to this same treatment. And what are some of the foods they could eat? They can eat, um, well, we also find that raw food is not very good because that gut is so inflamed. Probably the only raw food that would sit all right might be something soft like avocado, mm. uh, bananas, soft pears, they could be all right. Uh, definitely not grated carrot, you know, uh, shredded, cabbage, things like that. They need to be cooked so that it softens it. So the cooked vegetables. So they should are avoid the best. salads? Yes, yeah. What can what causes hormonal imbalances in men? Probably what causes hormonal imbalances in men is very similar to what causes hormonal imbalances in women. And a man could have a hormonal imbalance if his mother was on the pill for several years before he was born. Uh, also exposure to plastics, uh, that's, that's big today, drinking out of plastic uh, bottles and um, also eating food that maybe has been warmed up in plastic containers, that they are, they are all contributing to it. So what could they do to reverse it? Um, to, to reverse it they can uh, take the Anna's Wild Yam Cream because probably the symptoms of a male having a hormonal imbalance would be uh, he was very effeminate, it could be low sperm count, could be penile dysfunction, mm. could be prostate problems and we find that all of these respond to applying the Anna's Wild Yam Cream. What about bioidentical estrogen? Bioidentical estrogen probably progesterone you mean. Yeah, bioidentical progesterone. That can play a role with some people and one of the reasons why I don't usually advise it is because it's putting progesterone into the body and when you keep putting something into the body that the body makes it gets lazy and stops making it. Whereas the Anna's Wild Yam Cream it stimulates the pathway in our mm -hmm. body that our body uses to make its own progesterone. But if a lady's just found out she's got breast cancer, she's having hot flushes every hour, that that natural progesterone, that bioidentical uh, hormone, that could pay, play a role initially because she needs help quickly to get that to get that balance back. So she might she might go on the bioidentical hormones for four to six months to get mm -hmm. that initial kick start and then go over to the cream that'll stimulate her body to make it. Um, you speak a lot about the research and, and what's out there regarding the benefits of a plant-based diet, but the Bible speaks about eating meats as long as they are clean meats. Mm -hmm. So what would a Bible-believing Christian um, do about that? They have that confusion as so the Bible says one thing, but then you're advocating to do plant-based. How would yeah. you address that? Well, I like to look to the optimal. And you can't, inc you can't improve on the Garden of Eden diet. And the Garden of Eden diet was a plant-based diet. And if you have a look at the meat eating in the Bible, it was really like after the flood, you know, it, there, was, there was not time for the crops to grow. And so they were able to eat some, some of the clean meats. And people say to me, you know, we collect kill our own cow, it's organic, we, we, um, we kill it in a humane way, mm -hmm. we mm -hmm. freeze it, we keep it fresh. I just say, well, I'll leave it up to you. <laughs> but personally, I, I prefer a plant-based diet. 
Do you know of any natural ways to help with appendicitis? With appendicitis, you've got an inflammation of the appendix. And so ice needs to be applied there straight away. And that's on the, on the right side, right near the right hip mm -hmm. is, where, is where your appendix is. And that will get the inflammation down. And having four enemas in a row to clean the, the bowel out. And after the fourth enema, you can get right around the, the colon and clearing the, the, uh, the bowel out can take pressure off the appendix. And it's quite possible that uh, that can avert the crisis. And what would somebody that had to, or ended up getting their appendix removed, what are some things that they could do to offset that? They would have to always have their eye on their colon in that they would need to give it the right conditions to function uh, effectively. Because one of, the, one of the roles of the appendix is it's the colon's oil can, so it lubricates the contents as it goes through. And the other role it plays is it releases antibacterial fluid so that if what's coming out of the small intestine is toxic, um, it ca calms it down as it's got to go all the way through the, the large colon. And so making sure the person has adequate water and a plant-based diet because vegetables have great fiber. And that chia seed gel that I was talking about pouring on your breakfast, that's excellent for encouraging regular colon evacuation. But another point, if someone has had their appendix out, there can often be a buildup of scar tissue in the area and castor or compresses on the area can help to break that scar tissue down. Speaking about scar tissue uh, and even stretch marks, can pregnant women use castor oil on their abdomen safely? Yes, yes they can. Besides your book Self Heal by Design, is there any other book that you have authored? There isn't, although there actually is. It's just not in print yet. <laughs> and it's a book that we're titling Sustain Me. And it's, uh, it's really just a handbook of natural remedies. And we're hoping that to be out hopefully within the next six months. You've mentioned before the dangers of eating and drinking together. Can you expound a little bit on that? Okay, it certainly is a common habit in most um, industrialized nations. But what drinking with the meals does, it waters down the digestive juices. So what you're doing when you're drinking with your meal is you're compromising or inhibiting your digestive process. And what the body, well, what the stomach has to do, it has to, it has to stop digestion. It has to um, absorb that fluid to bring that stomach back to a more acid state because it's only in an acid state that the enzymes can work and then return to digestion. In fact, uh, Dr. William Beaumont, in his book on digestion, he showed that uh, it can delay digestion to the point that there can still be some breakfast in the stomach at the end of the day when mm -hmm. the person's drinking a lot of fluid with their meals. If someone's thirsty after their meal, I say, by all means, have a mouthful. You know, a mouthful's not going to have a huge effect. It's more when large glasses are taken with the meal that mm -hmm. it can inhibit the digestive process. So what about soups then? What about soups? With soups, it's not a huge amount of liquid with a soup and the, and the soup is hot and the soup is mineral rich. And so that is absorbed very quickly into, you know, out, out of the stomach. What about somebody that has dry mouth and cannot make a lot of saliva? What could be the cause for that? I'm not sure what could be the, the cause of that. One would investigate as to how long it had been like that, if anything it had happened that could have um, caused that to be. I know some people that have had um, mouth or tongue uh, cancers and they've had radiotherapy that has burnt the glands that make the saliva and that certainly uh, 
has stopped that. So we'd always investigate to find out why that would be so. Now, would breathing through your mouth cause dry mouth? What, what, what is the proper way of breathing? Um, breathing through the mouth absolutely can cause dry mouth. So I would always ask why someone breathing through the mouth. And it's usually because of a buildup of mucus in the, in the nose, so it's not clear. But what the research has shown, in fact, there was a research done on monkeys where they plugged up their noses for six months and their whole face changed. The, the jaw dropped, the mouth just hung open the whole time. Mm. They even found that at the back of the nose, the, the tubes that take the air shrunk. And so can you see a vicious cycle mm. happens? So why would mucus be built up in the eustachian tubes? It's usually because of the allergy foods. It can be because the person's breathing in mold or chemicals, the mucus can build up to protect the lining of the nose against that. But the five allergens again, we find the dairy, uh, wheat, oats, peanuts and refined sugar, they are, are probably the main causes of this build up of mucus. So to eliminate those foods so that the person can start breathing through their nose. So with the monkeys, after six months, they taped the mouth <laughs> and, and opened the nose. So they were forced to breathe through their nose. And as they started breathing more and more through their nose, the little tubes at the back opened up mm. and their whole face structure changed. And of course, what the research and the science is showing us that nose purifies the air, it warms the air, it humidifies the air and it pressurizes the air Mouth does not do that. So mm -hmm. when you think about it, mouth is for eating, talking, singing, whistling, chewing. Mm. It's not for breathing. The nose is for breathing. And so when you breathe through your mouth, you're actually breathing dirty air into your lungs because it hasn't been filtered, warmed, pressurized like the nose does. And a lot of people don't think about that. So you mentioned that if you, those, the monkeys that were having their nose um, blocked, they started to have the holes in their nose closed. That's right. So that gives the meaning, um, if you don't use it, you lose it yes, a different meaning. Yes, yes, it does, it does. Speaking of allergens, um, with the five allergens you mentioned, does that have anything to do with hay fever as well? Or what causes hay fever or seasonal allergies? Well, we find, this is what we find, when people stop the five allergens, their hay, their hay fever recover. When people stop the five allergens, then they don't have the dust mite allergy anymore. When people stop the five allergens, they, they don't have a horse allergy anymore. We find all sorts of allergies to different things clear up when the people stop the five allergens. Wonderful. So there's hope then for people that go out there in the spring and they're avoiding nature because they That's have right. their, that, see, that sneezing sensation. That's right. Cayenne. You advocate very much and speak highly of cayenne, but there's a, there's a confusion because there is spices that are irritant to our stomach, but and cayenne pepper is, has a bit of a, a kick to it. Can you explain that, please? So I can because as a herbalist, I've studied the actives of the herbs. So the herbs that are irritants to the lining of the stomach are mustard, are chili, and black pepper. They definitely are spices that irritate the lining of the gut. Whereas cayenne pepper, it is a stimulant, but it's not a nervous system stimulant like uh, alcohol, drugs, caffeine. It's a blood stimulant. And Leviticus 1711 says the life of the flesh is in the blood. And so anything that stimulates blood is very helpful for the body. And the author that sheds light on this is Jethro Kloss. He's written a book called Back to Eden. Now he wrote that maybe in the mid 1800s. He devotes half a page to every herb and he devotes 10 pages to cane mm. pepper. <laughs> I think the only, other, <laughs> then the, the only other herb he devotes that many pages to is Lobelia. He calls Lobelia the ultimate relaxant 
and K in the ultimate stimulant. But again, it's not a stimulant as people have viewed, viewed stimulant in a negative way. It's a blood stimulant, so that's a, a positive way. And he quotes two doctors in Back to Eden. One doctor says it's impossible to abuse cayenne pepper. And the other doctor says it will never cause a lesion. In other words, it'll never cause a, a burn or an ulcer. And I'm helping a young girl in Australia at the moment who lost the top of her three, her first three toes in a motorbike accident. And she's been taking two capsules of cayenne pepper three times a day and it's having an analgesic effect because cayenne is an analgesic. So, so she's taking that internally yes, for her toes. Painkiller. Ah. And it's help, she's sleeping at night <laughs> after taking the cayenne pepper. So what are all the benefits, can you, well, there's many benefits. You, you mentioned, what, eight pages in Back to Eden, did you say? Or 10 pages? Ten. <laughs> 10 pages? Can you just briefly, from what you recall, just mention what are some of the benefits of cayenne well, pepper? Well, as a blood stimulant, it's stimulating the movement of blood. And the blood, as the Bible says, it's the life of the flesh. It has the oxygen. It carries the nutrients. It carries the water. It carries away waste. And it also carries the the white blood cells. So any area of the body that needs healing or needs a boost of healing, cane pepper will bring it to that area. So you can use it as a compress on the outside of the body if people have lost feeling in their feet, people have cold feet, peripheral neuropathy. Mm -hmm. The cane pepper on the bottom of the feet is, uh, is an excellent remedy to bring blood to that area. Any area of the body that someone has lost feeling because maybe from a stroke or a car accident, they can apply the cane compresses to bring to bring healing to that area. Underactive thyroid gland, the person can put a hmm. cane compress on their thyroid and that, that will help to wake it up. Internally, cayenne pepper can uh, boost hydrochloric acid production, so it helps with digestion. When it gets into the blood, it thins the blood. It, it's a vasodilator, that means it opens all the capillaries and it strengthens the arterial wall. So. That's just a touch on the wonders of cayenne pepper. So we should have that in a first aid kit. Absolutely. Mm. What can be done for cataracts naturally? Um, we've had a few ladies, mostly ladies, get back to us that putting the castor oil in the eye every, every day. In fact, one lady was doing it twice a day and when she went back to her doctor three months later, he said, oh, I can't believe it. The cataracts have got no worse. In fact, it looks like they're improving. <laughs> wow. A biggie, people ask us all the time, what can be done for toenail fungus? Toenail fungus. Toenail fungus is an illustration of there's fungus on the inside of the body. So um, buying my book Self Heal by Design and implementing the stage one and stage two antifungal um, food programs. Also taking herbs to uh, knock off the fungus internally and grapefruit seed extract and olive leaf extract are good for that. But externally, you can put oregano essential oil on the toenail, you can put grapefruit seed extract on the toenail, but I'm just warning you that can eat the toenail out. So it's a good idea maybe to water down the grapefruit seed extract or the oregano essential oil with a little coconut oil. So dilute it. Yeah, yeah. And that can be applied a couple of times a day to the nails. What can be done for somebody that has parasites? What's a good way that they can kind of dispel well, one that? Of, one of the reasons parasites would be active in the colon is because the colon is not in a very healthy state. <laughs> so they can uh, take some herbs to help clean the colon out. And they can also take some herbs to kill parasites. Now, um, the uh, pumpkin seed, the pumpkin seed has some bitter actives in it that parasites and worms hate. What about papaya seeds? Yeah, papaya seed. Yeah, that's what we call pumpkin seed. Oh, okay. So take a quarter of a cup, say, first thing every morning. That's the first thing you eat when you start breakfast. Fresh garlic. They, you know, that's a real deterrent. But also there are two 
very bitter herbs. One's called wormwood and one's called black walnut. They're incredibly bitter and they, they can kill parasites, parasites and worms. So what are some ways that somebody can detox generally? One of the best ways to detox is, is uh, stop eating for a couple of days. When we stop eating, all those energies that usually go to uh, digestion now start to cleanse and detox through the body. But at, uh, well, at Living Springs, we do juices every two hours. And the, the main juice is 80% carrot, 10% apple, 10% celery and that can be taken every two hours. Sometimes we add a bit of cucumber, sometimes we add a few more greens, sometimes we add a bit of ginger, sometimes a little bit of beet or beetroot. So we alternate the juices a little bit. So two days on juices is a great detox. What would you suggest for scarlet fever? Scarlet fever, it's something you don't hear of much anymore, but um, I talked to an old lady, now I was 25, she was 85, and she told me, she said, this is the cure for scarlet fever, pineapple juice. Mm. Because it seems to be there's a constriction happening there and the acid in the pineapple will break through that. So just fresh pineapple juice yeah. or with the skin, no well, skin? Well, she said even pineapple juice you buy would do it. Oh, wow. You know, it's interesting that she told me that many years ago, and I have not thought of it till you asked me. <laughs> and I just remembered that's what she told me. Interesting. Any natural remedies for morning sickness? Our pregnant women want to know, what do I do? I'm vomiting. I feel terrible. Yes. Well, my poor daughter, Emma, she vomited every day of all of her pregnancies, her whole six pregnancies. And... Uh, she found that what helped was uh, smelling essential oils. She used to have peppermint essential mm. oil that she'd smell. She found sipping on uh, fresh ginger tea helped. Some ladies have found that magnesium helps. Some ladies have found that an adjustment with a chiropractor can help. So it's a matter of trying those things. Usually after three months, the morning sickness eases. Now, I've heard of women eating uh, like saltine crackers because the salt helps with mm. nausea. Would you say that instead of doing that, maybe Celtic salt? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have any remedies for um, tooth grinding and jaw clenching? Okay. For tooth grinding and jaw clenching, it's probably a good idea for the person to visit a osteopath. Osteopaths are very good at manipulating jaw. There might be a bit of a... Uh, out of alignment there. Um, they may need to get a mouth guard while they sleep to just protect their teeth. Okay. Can castor oil or charcoal patches be used on pets? Certainly can, yeah. Can pregnant women safely use cayenne pepper? Absolutely, absolutely. How would you advise someone to treat melasma? So melasma is the discoloration of the skin and it's usually a result of a hormonal imbalance. Um, hormones certainly affect this. I know that every pregnancy I would get brown patches on my face and I noticed that my daughters, my daughters did too. And I've also uh, met a young man whose mother was on the pill for many years before she had him and he's now in his early 40s and he has it on his neck and back. Now, the medical treatment for this is to bleach the skin, which sounds quite severe. And then that person can never allow the sun to touch their skin. So the person who has it can uh, take the Anna's Wild Yam Cream. The balancing of the hormones may, may help. Speaking of Anna's Wild Yam Cream, We've also had a lot of women that have had full hysterectomies or partial hysterectomies contact us wanting to know, is the Anna still good for me? Can I still produce hormones even though all of my parts have been removed? Can you address that please? Yes, they can because if the ovaries are taken, then the adrenal glands kick in 
and the adrenal glands release a little bit of those hormones. So the Anagem cream still is appropriate for women who've had hysterectomies. And is the Anas good for women that have bone issues? We also get a lot of people with osteoporosis and hair loss. They want to know, will this help, with me, help me with my bones? Absolutely. There are two main hormones that, that are made. One is progesterone. That's the key hormone. And it's from progesterone that estrogen is made and testosterone is made. And estrogen stimulates osteoclast cells. So your osteoclast cells are the ones that take away the old bone. Your osteoblast cells are the ones that produce new bone. And it's progesterone that stimulates osteoblast cells. So every person with osteoporosis should be the, on the Anaswild Yam Cream, which stimulates the body to make more progesterone which causes a production of osteoblast cells, new bone cells. Can you put castor oil in your ear for tinnitus or hearing loss? You certainly can. What can be done for varicose veins? For varicose veins, it's usually an inherited factor, but what can compound it even more is if the person's constipated, that puts pressure on the legs. If a person's carrying too much weight, it puts more pressure on the legs. It's very important to uh, massage the venous system. You see the arterial system comes away from the heart, the venous system comes back to the heart. And our second heart that stimulates our venous system are our calf muscles. And so any exercise that really uses that calf muscle is excellent for varicose veins. So that's rebounding, mm. uh, exercise bike, swimming, but that person should not do running because of the jarring on it. And you can buy a cream called Witch Hazel, and Witch Hazel can be applied to the legs, which causes a constriction or a pulling in of the veins. Mm, wonderful, wonderful. Well, thank you, Barbara, so much for taking the time to answer these questions. I'm sure there are hundreds of other questions as well <laughs> in people's minds. But thank you so much, and may God bless you as you continue to, to teach for him and to advocate his health laws, because it's really his health laws. So thank you so much, Barbara. Thank you, Vanessa. It's a pleasure.